Organized Grind with Oracle Uno. Yeah, yeah. Recorded live at Craft Fruit Studios in South Minneapolis. Yes, yes, y'all. This is Oracle Uno checking in once again with yet another episode of Organized Grind, the podcast. Today, we have uh, an old friend of mine uh, from the Twin Cities, St. Paul to be exact. Uh, she's an author. And her cell phone is currently going off. Headphones uh, disconnected in a uh, in a uh, fit of panic. But uh, yeah, we got author, security extraordinaire. We got street team genius, uh, Samantha Koshio. Is that how you say it? Kosho. Kosho. Okay, I've never said your full name like that. Is that how you prefer to be addressed? It As an matter. author, or do you prefer Sam still? Sam's fine. Sam's fine. All right, cool. Well, yeah, we got Sam Kosho in the place. Um, man, we got so much history. We've done music together. We've been to shows together. Kicked it at Perkins with the homie Paul together. Uh, saw mad prof shows together. Um, thanks for coming on the podcast. How's everything going? Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, things have been good. Things have been really good. Yeah. I just turned 30, and uh, I was real nervous about it, and I'm honestly really excited now. Word. I yeah. got a lot of the dumb shit out of my out of my life in my 20s. I feel you. I'm in the I'm in the same same boat. You know, just just uh, turned 30 in July, and uh, at first it was kind of strange, and now I'm I'm pretty amped about it. I'm 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 excited about where. I'm heading in this new decade. For sure, same. You know? I feel like I have some kind of direction. Yes. Now, I definitely didn't feel that way when I turned 20. Right, right. <laughs> um, so when did we first meet? Oh, man. It had to be like 2008, 2008. 2009. Okay. You were putting out uh, you were putting out some singles back then. Okay. I know you were doing some stuff with uh, my buddy Drew. He was going by Drew oh, Ski yeah, Love. Yep, yep. And uh I found you on one of his songs. Okay. And was like, man, this guy's got an excellent voice. He's oh, got dope. A dope flow. Uh, I started following you, and I think we just became Facebook friends and started yeah like chopping it up. Yeah. Messenger way back in the day. I think it was through Drew, and then through Chris Goodwin. Yep. Yep. And then we kind of had like a circle of just like, hey, we all kind of like the same stuff. Yeah, just kind of like some local hip hop weirdos. Yeah. From yeah, exactly different parts of minnesota yeah 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 that's dope i'm trying to think all right so i know that we started to talk and stuff but did we meet at a show or something i think the first time we met was at a show yeah i think we met probably out at a prof show yeah to be honest that that would make sense because that was about the time oh, of, of like at I, the fine line yeah kvp2 i think yep i think it was a fine line show uh with soul crate Oh yeah. You were okay. outside ciphering. Ah yes, yeah. yes. Yep. Dope. Yeah, I think I have pictures from that too. I've I've been finding all of these files of just pictures from two thousand three and beyond and just going through them and stuff like that. It's been it's been dope. But yeah, that was a really good show. Um so all right. How we usually kick this off with people, um, do you remember what your first hip hop experience is in life? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I mean, I started listening to hip hop when I was really, really young. Okay. My stepdad showed me Bone Thugs and Harmony. Oh, nice! And uh, man, I was obsessed. Yeah. And that just kind of like kicked off me listening to N.W.A., Wu Tang Clan. I got really into Eminem as he was coming up. Sure. Um, I got really into like Ock Nelly. Um, really into like the Five O Four Boys. Um, okay. And. I was really into the mainstream hip hop for a while. Mm -hmm. um, then when I turned, I think it was about fifteen, I had a friend play me Atmosphere for the first time. Oh, okay. And I was like, "Holy shit! Okay, this is something that like resonates with me. This is something I, yeah. I identify with." Do you remember uh, what the first song was that you heard? Oh, "Always Coming Back Home to You." Okay. Was the first one I heard. Solid. Um, I can still. Sing it word for word without oh, yeah. the song on. Word. Um, that that song, yeah, that changed my life. Mm. I started to seek out more local hip-hop then at that point. Yes. Um, got really into POS, 
I got really into really all the other guys on Rhyme Stairs at the time. Mm-hmm. I Self Divine was really big. Hell yeah. Um, you know, I the felt I think felt two had just come out. Okay. Um, the tribute to Lisa Bonet. That was a great record. Uh, great record. Great, great record. record. Still got a couple of my favorite songs on Hell there. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, and I just I wanted to get involved, and I realized that like Rhyme Stairs was almost in my backyard. You know, I come from St. Paul, East St. Paul. Yep, yep. And um, I realized, well, I got a car. I can get to Minneapolis really easily. Like, I want to get involved. So I reached out and reached out and reached out and just kind of kept trying to find ways to insert myself. Sure. And I was able to get on the street team, uh, thanks to Kevin Beecham. Mm. And I just got involved, passing out flyers at different places, uh, leaving stickers and that kind of stuff out at like cheapo sure zoomies you know smoke shops that yeah. kind of thing did you ever uh stand outside of the show as people are oh yeah 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 many times that's like that's like the classic move right yeah there. yep the old gorilla tactic oh yeah yeah um so i did that for a while and got to go to the first couple sound sets and out at sound set one year Uh, unbeknownst to me, some Mm -hmm. guy passed me a flyer for a download code. And I went home that night and absorbed all the music that I got throughout the day because that was back when it was... uh, That was the first year that it was at Canterbury. Uh And people were just passing out CDs from their backpacks and download codes everywhere. And I went home with, you know, like 20 different things to listen to. And the first one I listened to happened to be that download code. It turned out to be... Prof and Roz, or uh, Prof and St. Paul Slim, excuse okay. me, yep, the yep. Recession Music album, yep. and th- something like hit me like a Mack truck when I heard it. Mm. It's like, what the fuck yeah. is this? Right. So I kind of reached out to those guys from there. Um, I was able to go to a POS show where they opened. I think it was the the Never Better release party. Okay, yeah, yeah. And Prof and Roswell opened for that. Right. And uh, I went up and I bothered Mike Gamble at the <laughs> at the merch booth, and I was like, "Hey, man, I love you guys. I love you guys. Let me get involved." And they were in the like really early growing stages at that point. Mm-hmm. And Stop House had just been formed, right? Um, probably a month or two prior. Yeah. And he wasn't. They weren't really in a in a process to bring people on and do any kind of street team stuff yet, because they had just their core group that they were doing stuff with Mm. um but i just really stayed persistent and kind of annoying and every time they announced something i'm like hey let me let me get involved let (laughs) me get involved uh eventually they let let me pass out flyers and then start to sell tickets and stuff like that to shows that's right we used to sell tickets to uh all the fine line shows the first king gampo uh release party at first ave oh shit um yeah we hand sold tickets for all that shit nice and uh yeah, man. I still work with those guys today. I still go and do merch booths for them. Um, we had uh, actually done a New Year's Eve show back at the Fine Line. This, That's right, yeah. This past year. Um, the first time that they did that was what? Like 2010, 11 or something like that? I think it was 9. I think it was 2009, a, so it was, it a, was ten a whole year. 10 year thing. Oh, that's yeah. tight. Yeah, I remember that first one. Yeah, yeah. that first one was wild, yeah. man. That's uh, I was... I was drinking a lot and partying a lot back then. <laughs> yep. Those were the days. <laughs> yep. Those were the days we actually had a huge uh, conversation before this, just uh, catching up and stuff, just talking about those glory days of being early 20s, shit show, yep. fiestas. Yep. <laughs> now just kind of old and boring, man. I go home from work and I, I love it, hang man. out with my cat. and I love it. Yeah. Um. Okay, so can you share like one of your wildest prof show experiences yeah yeah i once it's one of the only times i've been kicked out of a place okay um let's hear i think a lot of people have stories about getting kicked out of a prof show yeah uh mine we went down to the red carpet inn in st cloud i went with uh my buddy paul Uh who you mentioned earlier shout out paul yeah shout out paul we used to go to a lot of prof shows together and uh one of his friends tagged along with us, and then his cousin drove us all down there. Mm. Um, we were all living together in a house out in Fridley that we just partied at all the time. And he, uh, Paul had a couple bottles of Jameson, mm-hmm. and he's like, oh, let's drink them on the way down. So between 
him, myself, and then his friend Cindy that was coming with us, we drank two liters of Jameson by the time we hit like two towns over. I think it was Annandale. And we stopped and got another half liter, polished that off before we got to the venue. We're standing in line drinking Southern Comforts. Uh, it was Big Zach's birthday, okay. actually, that night, and he was opening for him. Word. So we bought him some drinks on stage. We're cheersing with him. <laughs> I went outside, got in a fight with somebody. <laughs> Paul ended up getting in a fight with somebody. Damn. I walked over to the car. We had no idea that we had gotten into fights. Yeah. Um, I walked over to the car, and I see Paul sitting against it. He's missing his glasses. He's missing his gauges, and... He was just like, man, I got kicked out. Me too. The whole ride home, we kept having to pull over so he could puke. Uh, I had just broken up with my ex-girlfriend. and Things were really tense at Mm. the time, and Mm -hmm. she happened to be there with a guy that she was dating before me. Oh, no. It was a big catalyst. Yikes. He was throwing up the whole way home. I was calling her, (laughs) screaming at her the whole way home. I felt so bad for his cousin, man. Wow. <laughs> he had to stay sober and drive us all, but oh, bless his heart. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's that. Wow. Um, what's uh, what's what's one of the biggest uh, lessons that you've learned over the years of working with Stop House and and all the guys over there, the guys and gals that that make the operation run? Oh man, I've learned so much from those people. They're just some of the most professional and like big-hearted humans I've mm. ever met. Uh, one of the things that I guess anytime we go into a venue to work, something that's like really instilled is just be respectful. Sure. You know, treat it as it's their home mm-hmm. and um, we want to be invited back to their home. So, yeah. you know, make sure you say please and thank you. And, yeah. Um, you know, just Word. don't be an asshole. Yeah, yeah. It's a, um, yeah, dope. Um, so... Throughout the years, I mean, so throughout the the music years, um, there was a point in time where me and you made some music, made yeah. some beats, yep. we rapped together, uh, recorded recorded that. I still have them in the vaults. But um, you've always been writing, right? Like you've yeah. always yep. been writing using the written word somehow, yep. some way, right? Yeah, I've been I've been writing since I was six. Um, okay, I had a. I, I had a, a rocky childhood, yeah, and I was kind of like one of those kids always looking for an escape. Um, had a lot of adult responsibilities at a really young age, mm. and um, it was either you know drugs mm-hmm. at the time, sure, or like art or writing. Uh, I was never that great of an artist. Um, I've learned to have a different perspective on that because art's just really about what you feel and you know how yeah. you view it, but. Writing was something that I was always able to really rely on. Anytime that, you know, I was feeling real depressed or real down, um, I could let it out Mm. on paper, Mm -hmm. and nobody was going to judge me for that. Um, You know, it wasn't going to talk back to me. It wasn't going to just give me advice. I could just say what I had to say and get it out. Sure. Um, Then I just, I really liked creating stories. And stuff. You know, I used to write about Lego characters. Okay. And, um, then I wrote some stories about skateboarders when I was into skateboarding when I was an early teen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just really always have been super intrigued by writing. Um, that was one of the things that really got me into rap music. Just the flow and right. the words. Right. Um, and the way that, like, some artist can bend their words and make things fit. Like, Andre 3000? Yeah. Holy like yeah man for sure that's i i view him more as a wordsmith than i do a rapper you yeah. know what i mean yeah um, um those guys are super impressive to me when when i was young uh and the the internet was was out but it was like you know like we're talking like 99 98 yep yep 2000 um i was able to read lyrics of songs and I would actually discover songs. I would read the lyrics first and fall in love with the lyrics. Yeah. And then because you couldn't just like Napster was was barely even out yet. Yep. Like Napster wasn't out yet. So like with underground stuff, like you had to be connected with people 
And I was, you know, just a kid, you know, like I got a lot of uh, the underground stuff from like the old, the, the old, the older kids at school and stuff like that. But that was basically my only source. So like to be able to read these lyrics, because there was just like some sites where they just had the artists and I'd be like, oh, that artist sounds interesting. I'm going to read some of their songs and stuff. And then when Napster and stuff finally started to happen and you could plug in and like, oh my God, I can actually go get this song. I would either be really excited, like, yo, this song is amazing, or really upset that it didn't live match, up to your match the yeah exactly yeah. like match the music that i made for it in my head when i read these lyrics you know like oh man this song was it you know but uh i just remember getting into songs that way and just reading these lyrics and the way they'd rhyme and just be like how how can they do uh, this yes like, how, do you, how does that go with that yeah and, and you're still painting a picture and and how like who are these people yeah right? still like, telling a story and yeah, still like yeah yeah um, so that's, that's, that's just really cool just to think about. Um, do you remember what the first thing was that you wrote? Like that you actually sat and wrote that you can remember? I mean, it was a story about Lego characters. About Legos. Okay. Yeah. So that was like the first. Yep. Yep. I learned how to read at a really young age. Okay. Um, my mom was a pretty hands-on parent. Oh, nice. Um, and she really helped educate me yeah. a lot as a little kid. Yeah. And, um. Man, I, I learned how to read full books when I was like three. Wow. And I, I knew back then that I wanted to write them. Um, okay. Because I, I thought it was cool. Yeah. Like, some of the books that I had read were 30 years old, 40 years old, and it resonated me kind of that that written word stays around. Sure, yeah. Um, and, you know, some of those stories, like, really influential really yeah. mean a lot of things uh so yeah i wrote a story about lego characters just trying to like take over the world i'm pretty sure it was like a two page long thing. sure uh that's that's yeah. dope um so throughout the years then um what are some of your favorite books that you've that you've read that maybe have influenced your style of writing honestly i i should read more yeah. I'm really bad about it. I'm kind of a workaholic right now because it's kept me out of a lot of trouble. I feel you. Um, in the past decade, uh, so I, I sacrificed some things like reading. Right. I I read The Alchemist recently within the past year. Okay. Um, that book's incredible. I know people say that a lot about it, but it's really just all about following your dreams and doing what's right to okay. you. Okay. Right yeah, I've heart. never heard of it before. It, I read it at the right time in my life when I was trying to make a decision about a career mm-hmm. um, and really which way I was going to go with it. And it really helped solidify my choice. Yeah. And, uh, man, yeah, that, that's a really good book. Okay. You should definitely read it. Dope. And then uh, when I first started writing my, uh, my debut novel, I was reading a lot of I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. Mm-hmm. And a lot of other Tucker Max's stuff. And he was a pretty, like, misogynistic party frat dude who told his tales of hooking up with girls mm. um, just in short format. I really liked the short format style yeah. that he wrote in just yeah. because my attention span sometimes isn't there and it was easier to digest. Sure. So I was really a big fan of that and I was able to sit and kind of read it while I was at work. And... I, I enjoyed his honesty about things and how he really didn't give a damn what he was saying, you know. Say what you will about his morals and, you know, maybe his ethical decisions, but the fact that he could be honest with himself says a lot to me. Uh-huh. Um, anybody who can kind of be honest with themselves tells me that they're in a place where they can grow or change or mm. learn from it, you know. So I found that pretty inspiring, and I knew I was in a place in my life where uh, I really needed that. So it was cool to see somebody who had arguably been a bigger douchebag than mm-hmm. myself mm-hmm. be 100% honest with it. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure he's had all kinds of repercussions, and I may have a lot of repercussions for this, but um, you kind of got to you gotta realize at a certain point, like, uh, yeah, right. I want to grow. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is your story. Right, You know right. what I'm saying? Like, 
good or bad or whatever like this is this is life yep and absolutely yeah it's it's dope um long legs in the twin cities is uh the name of the book we're gonna go it to is. a short commercial break real quick um i just want to make sure i'm i'm realizing because i know you so well i'm like oh snap i haven't like formally formally um given the listeners kind of your background um so just real quick if you want to just tell us like where you grew up um and uh basically what brought you here right now yeah yeah um so i grew up over by lake phelan kind of on the east side of st paul east side of st paul in minnesota uh, yeah i found myself getting into a lot of trouble mm -hmm. over there you were uh, born here i was born here born and raised in st paul okay yep, yep. um I was born at at United Hospital, Children's United. Okay. Right in the middle of downtown. Ramsey right here. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, haven't strayed too far. <laughs> um, I did for a while. I moved to Key West when I was uh, in my early 20s. I kind of stayed around here until then. I got in some trouble when I was 19 that uh, that kept me around here for a while and um, really made my life hard. Mm. I, uh, I wasn't in the best place mentally. And after I graduated high school, I uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do. I didn't have direction. Um, I kind of had lost that over the last two years of high school mm -hmm. and uh, had just some unique things happen in life that made it a challenge. And um, my mentality was just give up at the time. And mm. I was really doing a lot of, um, a lot of drugs and it was just really depressed and suicidal all the time sure and i had tried to kill myself and tried mm. to overdose on some drugs and was driving got myself uh you know pulled over and arrested and obviously at the time i was really upset about everything a uh, few months after that i was really thankful that it happened and that i had a new chance at life sure so you were, like, how old when that happened? 19. 19, okay. 19. Yeah, that's a lot to take at 19. It, it was. I I got in trouble uh, with quite a few things, and I was looking at a total of four felonies at the time mm. with a 25-year prison sentence over my head. Damn. Um, I was terrified, man. I, I can imagine. <laughs> I was a baby. Yeah. And uh, I just... I was willing to do anything I needed to to get myself out of the situation I you know I did everything I had to for probation and mm -hmm. um, really really tried to change my life around and get on the straight and narrow and how long was probation five years five years okay five years um, so once that was completed I had actually just graduated college because mm -hmm. I was part of what my probationary terms was just to be gainfully busy sure you know yep. 40 hours a week so I got a job, I got myself into school full-time, I got myself into a relationship that um, I, I could have been more faithful in, but um, mm. you know, there's a lot about that in the book. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, that, you know, I, I really tried to get my shit together, and I was uh, graduated school, college right before I was off probation, um, That's my dope. dad was living down in Florida in Key West mm -hmm. and he had some opportunities for me down there to work and him and I had always had a really rocky relationship. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really ever got to know the guy. Sure. Um, so I took the chance to just see what it was, you know? Mm -hmm. So I moved down there for about eight months and, uh, worked more than I ever have in my life. And what kind of stuff were you doing? I was, uh, helping run the bar and restaurant. We opened the restaurant uh, together. My dad had kind of already opened the bar before I got down there. Um, but I helped open the restaurant and hire the staff, create oh, the wow. menu. Wow. Um, you know, really put the place together. Okay. Um, what, like, what was the one proudest accomplishment of that role? Oh, man. That just you did. being able to fucking hold it together i was 23 at the time Ooh, yeah that's a lot and shit. Uh, everybody around me I, I don't know if you've ever been to key west but no it's a it's a small island it's okay. four miles by eight miles okay and wow that is a small island there's over 150 bars Damn. on that island and there's no bowling alley <laughs> for you know yeah so <laughs> your option is to drink down there really yeah um and wow. i got down there and like i just kind of saw that around me and 
I grew up with a lot of alcoholism in the household, mm. and I didn't want any part of it. Sure. Um, so I got sober while I was down there. Wow. Um, and went to AA meetings regularly, mm. and just really went entirely the opposite way. Yeah. Because um, that. It's impressive. Know, I heard something when I was getting out of jail, and the the lady who released me, she uh, she told me that 96% of people reoffend right. and that she'd see me again. Mm. And I don't think anything has lit a fire under my ass more than that yeah, sentence. That's good. Um, so, you know, I, I found myself in that uncomfortable situation and, you know, I could go one way or another and I kind of knew where the one way would lead me. Mm-hmm. So I, um, I worked as much as I could and stayed really, really busy with that. I had actually got a contract for this book while I was out there. We were hosting um, a, a private swingers party out there. Yeah. Um, that was pretty wild, but Key West was full of a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of, you know, private sex shows and sure. things like that. So yeah. we were hosting one of them at the bar and um, ended up talking with some people. And I was in the midst of writing this book at the time. And they, uh, I met somebody who was a publishing agent. We talked a bit, had some more meetings, sent her a short manuscript to what I had, and, mm. um, got a contract after that. And then I moved back here. Um, we got the bar up and running, leased it to some individuals. Organized grind with the work Recorded live at the studio in South Minneapolis. <laughs> You know, uh, so that's actually, that's funny that that happened. I'm going to keep that clip in there. So what happened, uh, well, you're going to hear it now, but uh, I'm not going to cut this up. But uh, that was a track from last episode um, that my homie Flinch produced um, and featured on, who passed away. And so it's almost like he dropped in to say, hey, what, oh, man. just real quick. So I'm, I'm going to keep cool. that in there for Flinch. Rest in peace, Flinch. Yeah, rest but, in peace, Flinch. So continue. I'm sorry. That was that's a That's rude all good, in, man. In, 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 interruption there. The universe does the things it wants yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I, uh, Key West. Yeah, I was down there for, for eight months. We got the bar leased. My mom was having some health issues, mm-hmm. so I decided it was best to move back here. And, uh, then I was kind of lost when I moved back here because I didn't have the same opportunities of work right out of the gate. And, uh, I drug my feet on it a little bit. And I think being back in familiar territory, um, I really, I, I wasn't doing hard drugs at the time, but I was dating a lot of women. Mm. I was really being a womanizer. And, uh, that was, that was my drug at the time. That was my drug of choice. And I really got back into that when Mm. I moved back to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my world for a few months. Um, and then I felt myself kind of falling down the wrong path again. So got a job and, uh, I was just serving at a music venue in St. Paul and, it was cool. I really liked the atmosphere. I really liked being in a music venue and being mm. back around music because after, um, th- there was not that in Key West. Key West, it was a lot of like cover bands, and right. island bands, yeah. a lot of reggae, and like I-, I missed the local hip hop. Sure. And I wanted to be more involved with it, and I tried to figure out, you know, how I could work more in it, and yeah, I got myself into security and um, started to kind of do that. As I was doing that, my dad passed away. He had gotten into an accident when he was down in Key West. He was mm. driving his motorcycle. Wasn't wearing a helmet. Drunk driver ran him off the road. And uh, he was airlifted up to Miami on life support for a month and a half. And uh, I was his emergency contact and mm. uh, had to... I was the the person who had to deal with all of it. I right. had to get him on Medicare and... Um, you know, sign all the paperwork and make all the medical decisions. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I was... And so you were you were how old at this point? I was 24. 24 now. I was 24, yeah. Um, and he ended up passing away 
a few weeks before my 25th birthday. Mm, I'm sorry. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's right, life, you right. know. And that whole thing really, really changed who I was as a person. Um, made me take a lot of things more seriously. I, for the first time in my life, kind of wanted to find a direction. Mm-hmm. Where before I'd kind of just been wandering around aimlessly and just seeing where the wind takes me. Mm-hmm. Um, I really wanted to figure things out. And I was in a relationship at the time I was taking real seriously. She had a kid and I was doing the step parent thing. And, um, you know, I just I wanted to provide for my family. Yeah. And I went full time into security and uh, she broke up with me. Broke my heart, mm. cheated on me. Mm. I got honestly what I had deserved from my previous relationship before that, in a nutshell. And uh, I was real devastated. Everything kind of all hit me at once because this was about a month after my dad passed away mm. that things fell through with her. Mm. And, Damn. Uh, yeah, I was. I was it's really. A lot at once. Yeah, I took it really hard because um, I hadn't quite coped with everything with my dad's death since I was so busy during the time that he was, uh, in the hospital and I, uh, man, I fell back into a really bad pattern for a couple months there Mm -hmm. and started doing drugs again, uh, started binging on them and I had just moved out on my own for my first time, got a studio apartment on my own. Um, I'd always had roommates or lived with my parents before that. Right. And I realized I had bills to pay and nobody else is going to pay them. Mm. So I worked as much as I could. And um, fortunately, you know, like working and having some good support systems in my life really helped keep me on the straight and narrow. Yeah. And uh, I just sensed that and like I kind of found an industry where I can work as much as I want. Mm -hmm. And keeps me really accountable and yeah I find that keeps me out of a lot of trouble how how did you get into security for the first time to be honest i wanted to see the weekend play oh okay <laughs> he was uh he was headlining at well i don't know he was he was on he was supposed to headline on that saturday night at somerset music festival and oh. i saw an ad on craigslist so i applied and i was like you know i've got off of craigslist huh yeah that's yeah. dope uh-huh i was like i got some of the experience that they're looking for i got enough customer service and like uh, i'll talk to them and see what they say yeah. so they brought me on um ironically i worked that friday and the sunday mm. of the music festival i couldn't even work the day that the weekend damn. played i had to work at my other job yeah. and they couldn't give me that off damn so i uh i missed that but i found that i really really loved security uh, I really loved working at festivals. I loved working around music. It kind of put everything together. And I just, again, kind of inserted myself yeah. and figured out how I can be more involved and how I can uh, get more hours and how I can grow within. Mm-hmm. And uh, I stayed with that company for about two and a half years doing all kinds of stuff. I ended up at another music venue, Mill City Nights at the time. I don't think... It, it's anything at this point. I okay. think it's just an empty building now. Hmm. Um, I was there for a bit, you know, and then I started at the the W nightclub. They've got a well, they've got a nightclub inside the W. Oh, okay. On the weekends, called the Living Room, hmm. and then a bar upstairs called Prohibition. Hmm. Um, so I started working the door there. Became the supervisor after about seven months, and um, just kind of realized like, yep, yeah, this is for me. Yeah. This is like the longest standing job that I've been able to be happy in so I have just kind of continued following the path along that I've done a lot of different things in that uh insecurity along the way I've done you know the building security sure the festival stuff I got involved on the management side a few times um is there one that you prefer there is yeah I found myself in the last three years working inside of venues um, when the Armory in downtown Minneapolis reopened as a music venue, yeah. um, I started there and was able to help open the place. Mm-hmm. Um, and I moved up pretty quick in the ranks there and ended up as one of the three people kind of running the security department. Um, 
stayed there for a couple of years, and now I am at uh, a new music venue. Mm. It's actually opening, like, I don't know when this will be released, but it's opening this week. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think I've been seeing some public things out there. I think you could talk about it at yeah, this point. Yeah, yeah. So they, uh, there's, like, a famed music brand, music venue brand called The Fillmore. Mm-hmm. There's, I believe, nine other in existence and other, like, influential music cities. Sure, yep. So they wanted to put one in Minneapolis. That's and they, dope. They finally did. Yeah. So we open uh, this week, and I'm over there now. Um, and that's awesome. Man, I'm stoked. You look like you're happy about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, yo, so we usually, uh, feature the artist music that, uh, come on the show. Yeah. I want to play your stuff though. Yeah. Yeah. You were nice enough to, um, request that. So I'm sitting on a ton of unreleased music. I've been busy just producing and engineering for everyone from Muja Messiah to, uh, Vinnie Crooks to a whole ton of people. So I haven't had too much time to focus on my, my own music, but uh, I did pull a couple tracks that I'm going to showcase. So the first one, um, shout out to my guy Flinch, rest in peace. Uh, we had an EP ready to go uh, before uh, his uh, untimely passing. And so this is one of my favorite songs off of that project, um, and it's called One Day at a Time. So this is Oracle Uno. One Day at a Time, produced by Flinch. We got Sam Kosho in the building, Long Legs in the Twin Cities out now, for all you reading folks out there. Uh, this is episode 46 of Organized Grind, the podcast. Organized Grind. Recorded, recorded live at Craft Studio in South Minneapolis. One Day at a Time. One Day at a Time. One day at a time, I'll keep on moving till I reach a peaceful place in my mind I'm competing with the sun, half the way that I shine Plotting in my dreams so I can wake up and grind It's all I know, hit the road, gotta get up and go Only God can judge me when I kick in the dough Maybe I should ghost, take a trip to the coast Maybe I should focus and just stick with the flows Drop a hit and go gold, would I be happy then? Yeah, I could do good, but not exactly when Looking in the mirror like what's happening I can see myself going mad again I guess I'm passionate, I'm sick of being runner-up No matter how much I hustle, I haven't done enough Take a break, I decline, I'm in line From my place in the sky, I'll be fine Anyway, get the side, one day at a time One day at a time One day at a time Feeling good, one day at a time. Learn to walk so I can strut without breaking my stride. Turn the music up and roll the windows down in my ride. On cloud nine style, about to hit the town, feeling fly. It's all I know, hit the road like there's nothing to it. It's after waiting for me to get up and moving. No validation needed, done enough to prove it. Don't never fuck it up by doing something stupid. Moving with much improvement, cruising another level. Demanding what I'm worth and I will never settle. I do it like it's never been done, that's the MO. And I'm over go, you know, in case you didn't get the memo. No stretch limo, just a hoopty with some miles on it. Drop another beat and I'm bound to go wild on it. Taking what's mine, I'm in line for my place in the sky. I'll be fine anywhere at the side. Take it one day at a time. One day at a time 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 Yes, yes, y'all. This is Organized Grind, the podcast, episode number 46. We got Samantha Kosho in the building. Uh, that is the name that is on the cover of the book, so that is how I shall address her. Um, she just released, uh, Long Legs in the Twin Cities, which is, um, quite an interesting read. Um, I've been lucky enough to have 
been your friend since the conception of this yeah. book for yeah. some of the rough drafts i was supposed to do some art and i fell off like i did with the podcast um <laughs> but uh sometimes you need to fall off for yourself yo falling off is like the best move you can make sometimes it is, it is. straight up and then you can always pick right back up that's right but uh so you released a book yeah man you, you wrote yeah a, you conceptualized you spent how long on writing this I've thing i've been writing this book since 2012 Two, so Eight years. We'll yeah. call it eight years yep. in the works. And not to mention the life experience that went into this book. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so to start, I mean, what gave you the idea for the basic, for the, for the basis of the book? Well, I mean, so I, I was in a relationship. The one I was kind of talking about when I got out of jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you could try it, center on the mic. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and I, I loved that girl. Um, it, that she was my first love, mm. and uh, I really fucked up and really did her wrong in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I had known that, and she was the one who ended things, and then she wanted to get back together for a while, and um, I refused because I I realized how fucked up I had been in the relationship and mm -hmm. I didn't really understand why mm -hmm. and it was pretty concerning um like obviously I knew the reasons how I had fucked up like you don't go fuck somebody in your college bathroom stall if you're in a relationship with somebody much mm. less engaged you know we were engaged at the time and I was sure screwing around with other people sure and uh, I didn't know what exactly was, like, causing that uh. desire and that feeling inside of me. Um, so I knew I needed to work on myself a bit. Um, I've been in and out of therapy since I was 12. Okay. And I had been more out of it than in it sure. up until that point. Sure. And I... Uh, the day that we actually broke up, I'd been in therapy for about two months at that point, uh -huh. and I knew I couldn't give up, call it quits, right. you know, do anything crazy like that. So I decided to sit down. Mm. Uh, I went to a bar, thought about just drinking myself stupid. And instead I had, you know, a couple sips of a beer and just started writing and writing and writing and writing and getting it out. And I read it back and I was like, holy shit. Okay. That makes sense. Mm. That explains some things that it was a, it was a lot of things that I felt that I didn't realize I had felt. I wasn't conscious of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I kind of was able to look at it and realize, well, here are some of the things you need to change. I bet there's a lot of other things, too. Yeah. So I continue to just kind of work on writing about things as, uh, as they were happening. Um, I originally was just going to write a giant fucking book about her and try to get her back in my mm. life and hope she fell back in love with me and that we'd be together and ride off into the sunset. And then I started dating other girls uh, and just having fun and fucking around. And then I just started writing about the girls I was fucking around with because mm. I enjoyed it. And mm. um, the girls really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, uh, um, <laughs> just to slow down, uh, uh, when... When was your first relationship? Like, like your first real relationship? With a woman when I was 18. When you were 18? Yep. How did that develop? The, it was... Yeah, like... It was insane. Yeah? Uh, it was, like, pretty explosive out of the gate. We hooked up one night in her dad's garage. Um, she got me drunk mm. and like, she knew what she was doing. Okay. She had been with other girls before and sure. I had no idea. Um, 
even though I always found women attractive, uh-huh. I dated guys and I didn't like see anything wrong with it. Yeah. I though that night like. She climbed on top of me, and I was like, "Oh my god! Okay, all right, this is it. Yeah, this is this is what I want." And uh, I chased her for a while. She was in a relationship at the time, and uh, I she ended up leaving her boyfriend, and uh, we we dated on and off for seven months or so. And at the time, both of us were pretty heavily involved in drugs um i was so really... when you're talking drugs are you are you talking like are you talking like shrooms or are you talking no, like pills at this point i was doing a lot of oxycontin okay um i was doing a lot of oxycontin I was doing a lot of cocaine I was doing um a lot of xanax okay so the synthetic uh, harder shit yeah yep yeah, yeah. yeah. um the dirty yeah, shit yeah you yeah. know um i was really caught up in the oxycontin for a while mm-hmm And so was she, and we were, like, both just pretty, like, dope sick together, Mm. and it was a a really toxic thing for both of us. Right, and you you had said, too, that you kind of, you affiliate the women with a drug as well. Very much so, yeah. So that's kind of feeling that cycle even stronger. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, feeding the beast. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. 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 It was a, <laughs> it was a bad cycle, man. Yeah. It was, a. yeah, it was not healthy. So, so you were like 18, 19? Yeah, I was 18. A- 18. 18. Okay. 18. Um, and things ended the, the day I went to jail. Okay. So it was uh, September wow. 9th, I think, okay. of 2009. Okay. It was a little bit, a year, a little after a year I'd graduated from high school. It was like 999, September yeah. 9th of 2009. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, that is. Um, I, it ended, <laughs> you know, yeah. I went to jail and uh, we had already been so much more off than on at that point and I think she was probably in a better mind state than I was and realized things needed to be done Mm -hmm. and she really did me a favor by doing that it was difficult for me to deal with um when I went to jail I was I was so high that I I didn't sober up for the first five days wow and like I didn't realize that any of this had happened i tried calling her and she was just like no like yeah. this is this is what happened and i was like oh fuck Damn. okay like uh, i gotta reevaluate things yeah um I, I took it to heart still for a while i remember that that year when uh the vikings lost to the saints in the playoffs mm. there was a, a huge storm and i was over at a friend's house and i had walked all the way to her dad's house just to argue with her about it and it blamed it all on her, you know, it was her yep. fault that the Vikings lost just cause I was pissed uh, off and, uh, man, I eventually I got over it, you know, yeah. um, and I started dating my then fiance and, um, yeah, I think just realized I wasn't ready to settle down at that point. I really, really, really liked women Okay, and I wanted to explore right. as much as I could. So, so if you could, all right, if you could describe your book kind of in, in a short breakdown, uh, ah, in a short breakdown, um, cause I don't want to give too much away, but I also, you know, cause the conversation sure. that we're currently in is almost like, uh, we're almost on book territory right For now. For sure. Yeah. So I just want to make sure. Um, but how would you briefly describe your book to somebody? So each chapter, uh, individually details, a different woman that was involved in my life in a romantic way. Okay. And it kind of goes from the start of it to the end of it. And what I personally took from that relationship and how it helped me grow as a person. Um, their perspective might be a little bit different. You know, it's a hundred percent from my perspective. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it really was just a, it was a tool for me to, become a, a real stable adult okay um have you what kind of feedback have you gotten have people figured out 
who they are in this book. Oh, I mean, all the women that I wrote about, like, I, I changed their names mm-hmm. um, because my, my ex fiance comes from a prominent family sure. who would sue the Word. shit out of me. Word. Um, so I, I changed everybody's name. I really... I, I read what my legal rights were. Mm. Um, okay. But I also allowed all of the, the women that I'm still in contact with mm-hmm. a chance to read what I had written about them before it was published if they wanted that. Um, most of them said yes, and I, uh, I've gotten positive feedback from every one of them but one, which, okay. which was to be expected. Sure. Our relationship was yeah. arguably one of the rockier ones. Right. Um, and I, I tried to tell things as honestly as I could, because um, I think that's really important. That's what helped me grow, and mm-hmm. that's really what I hope that other people take from this is like... You can be a shithead. You can come from, yeah. you know, a not so great place. Right. And as long as you can learn from it, like, it's good. Hell yeah. You're doing all right. Hell yeah. Long legs in the Twin Cities. Um, you know, it was really cool watching you go through the entire process with the book. Um, I used to write some of that on your on your couch in your bedroom. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, um, so... How did you even begin the process of uh, kind of legitimizing the publishing? Like, how, like, what was that like? Because this is probably very inspirational to many people who may have thought of writing someday. Because you're the homie. I never, I never fathomed when we first started to hang out that you would be a published author. Excuse my stutter, but I had to say it. Um, but, like, you are now, you know what I'm saying? And, and, like, watching you go through it was super impressive, inspirational. Um, what was that process like for you? Like, how did you go about finding your connections and getting this thing packaged up and published? Yeah, yeah. Um, man, so I, when I first got the publishing contract, it really fell into my lap. Um, and I... Did as much as I could at the time, you know, I published a short story with that company. Um, I got to do a book signing down in Jacksonville, Florida for that. Wow. Um, yeah, that was really cool. That was my first experience doing that. And, uh, I just, I wasn't ready to finish the book yet because I was still living Mm. the story Mm -hmm. and I drug my feet on it for a while. Um, I'd finished it. I wasn't really happy with it. I'd change it. I'd escape to a cabin, you know, every few months and spend two or three days locked away working on it. Mm. And eventually I just got to the point where I was like, all right, this is it. I'm done. It's got to be out there. Um, My my current girlfriend, actually, she's got a, a degree in journalism and she's, you know, real good with words. Nice. And she helped me edit the whole thing. Uh, before I even asked her out on a date, it was wow. kind of like a test. It was like, you know, if you can read this and yeah. you uh, you still want to give me a chance, like, <laughs> right? Cool. Yeah. And here's uh, the, here is uh, the history. Yeah, here's my baggage. The resume. Like, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna find out anything new now. <laughs> um, right. So that's dope. Yeah, uh, she helped me edit the whole thing, and uh, I learned uh, learned about pronouns. Mm. <laughs> That's one thing I'd messed up uh, pretty consistently was pronouns. What's so. the biggest thing you learned about pronouns? Uh, when to capitalize and when not to. Okay, sure. Um, yeah. I capitalized like mother, father, that kind of stuff. Oh, sure. Like, yeah, yeah. I didn't need to. Yeah. Little did I know. Huh. So she helped me out a lot, uh, kind of gave me the confidence to realize like, okay, now this thing is, I'm done with it. It's polished. Um, I just want it off my plate. Hmm. And that... The whole process, yeah, it took about... I got my contract in 2014. Okay. Where did the contract come from, or how did you get into that there situation? There was a publishing company. Um, they were actually out of Fort Myers, Florida, but the agent that I met was living in Key West, Florida. Oh, okay. Um, sure. It's called Black Widow Publishing, and yeah. they mostly did romance. Um, they pushed me to write a lot, a lot racier. Oh, um, sure. I wasn't super comfortable writing about all the sex because I was <laughs> yeah. like, you know, I had it. I did it. Right. And yeah. I, not everybody needs to know. Right. Um, but that was their big thing. So uh, there's, there's quite a bit of that in the book. Um, by the time 
it was done. I sent it over to them, and it turns out the publishing company disbanded, no longer exists. Wow. So I was I was pretty fucking devastated. Yeah. And didn't really know what to do. I didn't have another plan for it, um, but I also wasn't surprised because at this point it had been five years since I got in contact with them about this. Um, so it you know. I'm glad it didn't come out through them because if that was going to be the future anyways, that they were going to disband, um, yeah. it probably wouldn't have gone anywhere. And they were taking such a high percentage of my royalties mm. with the contract that I had signed. And um, they didn't seem like they were going to help push it yeah. too much. A lot of the promotion and advertising was still going to fall on my shoulders. So I looked at different options for a while. I mean, for the first couple months after I got the feedback, I was really discouraged, and I just kind of shelved it. Sure. And it's like, eh, fuck it. Yeah, like, yeah. I know it's done. I did it for myself. Nobody else needs it. Mm-hmm. And then I woke up one morning. Like, I had looked at some self-publishers in the past, and I kind of looked at them um, right when I got the news from them. And it's it's really expensive. And you still have to do almost all of the footwork on your own. Mm-hmm. So, like when you say really expensive, like how much are, are we talking? The lowest that I found just to get it into print mm-hmm. was like eight hundred bucks, and, and that gets you like how many copies? Or whatever. that doesn't include any copies. No copies. That includes zero copies. Okay. You still have to pay, you know, individually Damn. per copy. So that's like the cover charge. Like yes. it's eight hundred just to get in the door. Yep. Um, which you know, I'm a fucking yeah. I'm a working class individual. Right, 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 right. Lives on my own right. and you know pays my own bills yeah. and you know, um, ain't getting no loans or any of that. No, know? no, and security doesn't pay that well. So I, uh, I again was just discouraged and that's really when I shelved it until I, I woke up one morning like five o'clock in the morning and had just one of those aha moments mm-hmm. and was like, why don't you look at Amazon? Like, have you ever fucking self-published on Amazon. You ever thought about that? Um, Because I had heard some random people talk about doing it. Sure. When I had first started with this company and I was doing book signings, I added a bunch of their authors on Facebook and have kept in touch with some people in the publishing world. And I have seen that other people have done that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I woke up at five in the morning to that thought and went and checked it out and realized how simple it was yeah and it cost zero money up front um really all i needed was manuscript cover art um the basic you know components sure of the book and, uh went ahead and did it that morning and so just, so do they kind of print upon the order yeah they print on a man Okay. Yep. Print on demand. Yes. Yep. Yes. That is. Yep. Yes. Um, so yeah, as soon as one's ordered, they'll print it, ship it. Huh. I think I, I've had quite a few people order them. And they say it, you know, it takes about a week. I ordered a, a large bundle of them for myself. Um, did and, you uh, get to pick how it felt and stuff like that? Like yeah. the material and everything? Yep, yep. They gave you the choice for all that. It changes the price on it a little bit, and I wanted to make it like pretty cost effective yeah. for people. It looks very nice. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Like you would never guess that it it's as simple as you're making it sound right now. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, fortunately like I have some graphic design background. I studied that in college for a bit, so I, I had some programs to do that. Um I've had to format things, you know, for college essays and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. It was the formatting of it was the most difficult. I kind of already knew what I wanted for a cover in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was it was pretty easy to get it out there. And then uh, the formatting took me about 10 hours of trial and errors mm. and like watching YouTube videos sure. to finally figure out. Um, and then, yeah, it was out there. It took less than a weekend. Wow. It, uh, That's dope. Yeah. Well, congratulations. It, it Thanks, looks man. amazing. Thank you. I'm so happy that those eight years of your life, I mean, it's really, in the process of the book is is an amazing story within itself. Just, you know, it had its good days. It had its bad <laughs> days. It was looking like it was down for, 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 for the count and stuff. And then it came back up and boxed its way back up. And now it's out. Yeah. yeah that's super dope. So Long Legs in the Twin Cities, uh, where can people pick it up? You can pick it up on Amazon. 
Um, it just look up Long Legs in the Twin Cities. Okay. There's a digital book, and you can buy a physical copy. Um, I personally have some physical copies. I'm working right now at getting some copies inside of Electric Fetus, um, potentially some other local retailers. Um, I've been working like crazy, so I haven't made the time to yeah. go out and like hit the pavements. Right. Um, yeah, it's I've work. Got a potential book release party okay. in the works. Okay. Um, still working good. on finalizing some things, uh, but. It's at the Fillmore. No, <laughs> no, no, it's at the Fillmore. No, no, no uh, it would be at Honey, if anything. Oh, word. We, we've okay. kind of got a date, but there's still a lot of stuff to be hammered out. So potentially it's going to be March 22nd at oh. Honey. Uh, it's a Sunday. Uh, Amber Ace Cleveland, if yeah, you know her, she's yeah, been yeah. helping Shout me out. out. Amber Ace Cleveland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super dope. Chick. Ace, hell yeah. Yep. Yeah, she, uh-huh. she's, she's been doing great work since forever. She has. She has. She's uh, just like yourself. Just a fucking a true true grinder. Yeah, she true grinds. Hustler. Yep. Um, so she's been helping me out a lot. So that's dope. We'll see exactly what happens. Um, I don't have a ton of funds to make it happen, so um, I'm not too hurt one way or another. Word. Well, and, hopefully, uh, if people are listening, they'll go pick up a copy of Long Legs in the Twin Cities on Amazon.com by uh, Samantha Kosho, and yeah. that is. Just to make sure that is spelled last name K O S H I O L. That's right. You, who knows? I might have wrote about uh, about your wife, oh, or your snap. girlfriend, or oh, uh, snap. your sister, maybe your mom. Uh, Yo, I'm gonna get into this last commercial break, and then uh, we'll wrap this thing up. So, uh, yo, this is Organized Grind, the podcast with Oracle Uno. We got Sam Kosho. Thanks Long for having me, man. Cities. Of course. Episode 46. We will be right back. Hey, what's up, world? This is Oracle Uno on the check-in. Are you looking for a gift idea for a loved one or maybe yourself? Why don't you let me paint you a custom-painted canvas, 12-inch vinyl, or skateboard deck? All you have to do is give me the names and the colors of your choice, and I'll have it done, painted, and shipped within a week of your order. For canvases, I start at 11 by 14 inches and up, 12 inch vinyl records, just like the records that you would put on a turntable and listen to. They are records from my personal collection that um, I just don't want no more, so I'm turning them into art. And then skateboard decks, I offer just the deck or a fully built skateboard option. Once again, that's free shipping in the US. If you're interested, check out graphrootsmedia.com. That is G-R-A-F-F as in fresh, R-O-O-T-S-M-E-D-I-A.com, graphrootsmedia.com. Thank you for listening to Organized Grind, the podcast, and your continued support. Peace and love. Yes, yes, y'all. Organized Grind the Podcast with Oracle Uno, episode 46. Been kicking it with Sam Kosho. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations again on releasing this book. Like, I really can't express how proud I am of you for doing it. Thank you, man. Um, Have anything planned for the future here? Uh, Yeah, I got a couple other books that I want to write um, unrelated. I've got some deleted chapters Ooh. from this book that I think I'm going to put out kind of an extended version. That's dope. Um, maybe just as an ebook. Oh. Um, but I got some other books that I, I want to work on. Um, so stay tuned. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, other than that, man, I'm just a fucking workaholic. I try to work 60 hour weeks if I can regularly. Shit. And, uh, Gotta get some sleep, though. How's your sleep going? Yeah, yeah. Uh, depends on the day. Yeah. Depends on the day and the week. Yeah. Uh, this week is a little more challenging just because we we open to the public this week, so we got mm. six sold-out shows back-to-back. Yeah. Um, but, man, it's... Uh, Hanging I'd in there, I'd much though? rather have it this way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good. Yep. That's um, good. I try to find a balance, and sometimes my social life is the thing that takes a hit, so... It's been super nice to catch up with you because we yeah. don't get to do this often. Yeah, of course. That's one of like the perks of this podcast is that it's kicking it, but I can use it under the guise of work. Yeah. Like, hey, you right. want to get some work done? You want to be on the podcast? Cool. Right. But really, it's just an excuse to have no phones and just kick it with each other. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And catch up. So 
I appreciate you coming out. Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, you were talking about a, you might have a potential release party maybe under wraps right now. It's yeah. In, it's, it's cooking. It's, uh, it's cooking. cooking. I, uh, you know, stay tuned on Facebook and all the social medias. I, uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and all that stuff under the same uh, the same username. It's at S Kosho, S K O S H O. Okay. Uh, you can find me on Facebook too by my full name. Um, feel free to add me as long as you're not some creeper ass dude. I'll probably add you back. Um, and yeah, man, I uh, I'm looking forward to the future and just. Looking forward to thirty and yeah. uh, in my thirties and yeah. being a an adult, I finally am as old as I feel, which yeah. is a nice balance. Yeah, we're definitely we're definitely there, you know. Um, so uh, this is the song that I'm gonna end the podcast with. Uh, it's another one of my joints, unreleased. By the way, uh, Vinnie Crooks is dropping uh, just a Northside Kid. That is a seven track project that I produced. It's coming out very soon. Uh, check out Vinny Crooks. It's, uh, it's, it's exactly how it sounds, Vinny Crooks. Check him out. Uh, it's some of the best work that I've produced. But uh, this is another unreleased track that uh, I've been sitting on for the past year or so. But uh, it's turned into one of my favorites. I've been doing this process of just putting songs on a CD and whichever ones get old, I kind of like whichever ones I start skipping. I'm like, all right, like phase it out. But the ones that like I always play, like they're starting to rise to the top. And for whatever reason, this song was made um, at like four in the morning after I got home from a crazy show at the Nomad and I had a few drinks and I was just like, I want to go home and rap. And yeah, so that's when the best stuff happens. I made this beat, wrote this song, recorded this song. I was done at like six in the morning, passed out hard, woke up the next day and to this. And it's become a lot of people's favorite song that I've made in a while. Hell yeah. So it's a fun song. It's called uh, Move. And uh, I produced it. So once again, we had Sam Kosho. Thank you again for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, man. It's the, been it's been a pleasure. Yeah, this has been Organized Grind, the podcast with Oracle Uno. As always, peace and love. Organized Grind with Oracle Uno, recorded live at Graph Fruit Studios in South Minneapolis. <laughs> I keep my cool with the weapon of doom Let me resume Toasting up to the moon My everyday life's a roller coaster to you I'm overdue with the pivot Doing what they didn't Grinding for the rent and I was doing any minute It'll take a lot of years for you to do it how I did it Focus on the come up, keep it moving with the business Poltergeist, smacks bet when I roll the dice When I die, coke, you can hold the ice What you think of sight is as thin as glass Jacob pieces on the easy path Wild style, I exist with the graffiti at Two-stepping on the path to logic What you know about making moves? They think they so smart but can't take the clue Move, put your fucking hips into it Dumping bombs into the crowd just to get some movement Doesn't matter how it's done, you just gotta do it Feel the pressure on the run, gotta keep it moving Move, put your fucking hips into it Dumping bombs into the crowd just to get some movement Doesn't matter how it's done, you just gotta do it Feeling pressure on the run Light speed, feeling free, chilling with the breeze Pretty steep city streets, I'm a millipede Straight bugging, coming up from nothing Stack a little money, now we getting into something Buzzing like DoorDash, old school as DoorDash Sharp as a katana, while you soft as a floor man Wheel spinning on the black ice Shining out the top like a flashlight Snapping when I rap nice Known to grab mics and rock the party Have a couple drinks and start talking gnarly be worthy on some Mardi Gras trees Vaporized trees and never catch me off beat Mr. Frosty, I ice your coffee Bobby Thunderstorm with the lightning offering Move, put your fucking hips into it Dumping bombs into the crowd just to get some movement Doesn't matter how it's done, you just gotta do it Feel the pressure on the run, gotta keep it moving Move, put your fucking hips into it Dumping bombs into the crowd just to get some movement Doesn't matter how it's done, you just gotta do it Feel the pressure on the run, gotta keep it moving For the free to them with the breeze. Move, my 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 my
breeze Pretty steeds city streets I'm a millipede Move, my velo, my velo, my velo My velo, my velo, my velo